Hello YouTube. Tamriel is full of interesting and unique creatures and I've covered the lore of many of them on this channel over the years. And today I bring you this long video where I combine the lore on all these creatures that I've covered and put them into one long form lore video, edited for your convenience so that you only have one really long lore video to watch. I put timestamps in the description so that if you already know the lore of a certain creature or you just want to skip it like this intro, you can skip it if you want. And finally, before we begin, this isn't a definitive list of all Tamrielic creatures. It's rather a collection of lore deep dives into several really interesting ones that we've talked about on this channel in the past. And who knows, maybe I'll do another one of these long lore collections once I've covered a few more creatures on the channel. Anyhow, with that said, let us start with the lore on nymphs after the intro. So the nymphs, elusive creatures if anything, whom we haven't seen since Daggerfall, and with good reason, I mean, look at these sprites, well, yeah, they're basically just naked women. But that isn't to say that despite their not so child friendly appearance that they aren't interesting. Anyway, nymphs in the Elder Scrolls universe are viewed in the same fashion that most of us view them. Magical creatures who look like naked women, and the stigma among in-universe academics, so on Tamriel, is that they're rare but very promiscuous and fulfill sexual desires for anyone who approaches them. Therefore, the in-universe academic scene on these creatures is not very broad as most in-universe scholars view the nymph as a creature not really worth for research and all documentation the people on Tamriel themselves really have on them is that of basically borderline pornographic descriptions and crude half-fiction by those who claim to have met a nymph. That said, most of that is proven to be untrue by a man named Von Tambaris, a scholar of the Imperial University, who at some point decided to do some research into what nymphs are really like and whether the stereotype that pe the people of Tamriel have on these creatures is accurate or not. Needless to say, he was ridiculed by most of Tamriel's academic community and not many took him seriously. Luckily for us, he wasn't dissuaded by his peers and decided to start researching the nymphs anyway. And his findings are definitely notable. First of all, he started with the language. Nymphs have their own language, something which is a perk to acquire in the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Learning the language of the nymphs means that they won't attack you. This language is said to be very complicated and very hard for the people of Tamriel to learn, as it's very alien and sounds extremely melodiously. But what's very curious about the language is that Vondhem, the researcher, uh, found that it's very similar in sound to the Aeliot language, but that it doesn't share any words with the Aeliot language. The language of the nymphs sound very similar, but is in fact a very different language. This could mean that either the nymphs are far, far, far offspring of the Aeliots, which I personally find not too likely since their language is so different and alien to the people of Tamriel, while other elvish languages which sort of branched off from the original elvish language are very similar. Look at my video for the elvish languages for that. And we know that the language of nymphs cannot be learned easily by the people of Tamriel, unlike many of the other languages on Tamriel, with the exception of the Argonian language, which is also very hard to learn, as I discussed on my video on that language, uh, which is the Argonian language Gel. I personally suspect that the nymph language is basically its own thing and that it doesn't share any characteristics with other languages on Tamriel, as it's evolved on its own, because it's a completely separate race of creatures. Hence why it's so hard to, to learn for other people of Tamriel, just like the Argonian language, which is so separate from all the other languages that it's very hard to learn for any elf, human or Khajiit on Tamriel. Anyway, back to the nymphs. I personally find it far more likely that the nymphs somehow heard the Aelid language and created their own language through imitation of the sounds of the Aelid language, but then their language themselves being completely different, but just sounds similarly. I think this is because nymphs are very shy and solitary creatures, contrary to what many scholars on Tamriel believed prior to Von Tambaris' research. They don't mingle with people or elves, or they don't like to be among civilization at all, and they are very wary of humans or elves, not even showing themselves to the people of Tamriel, unless the nymphs have a very solid feeling that they can trust an individual. Meaning that they probably hid themselves, but did hear the aliens and modeled their own language after the same type of sounds. That said, since they are so shy and live in solitary life, nymphs are very, very rare and even more rarely seen in places with a lot of population. There, rather, they often live in very far off places, apparently often close to the coast, even though in Daggerfall they don't seem to be associated with the sea. 
They often live in caves and grottos, minding their own business completely and shying away from anyone who finds their homes, which are usually desolate places with a lot of beautiful nature around it, because nature seems to be the most important bones of their habitats, and they can often be found on far off coasts or even deserted tropical islands. Von den Bauers in his research needed to spend three months of patient waiting, bringing small gifts and presents for the nymph and posing himself as a non-threatening individual to Ayalea, which is the nymph that he had located and wanted to get into contact with. Until the nymph, who lived in a cave far off the coast of Hammerfell, would finally show herself to him. And only after addressing her in her own language did she open up to him. He describes the nymph as being beautiful and aesthetically perfect, with her smile and laugh being enchanting, but also found her to be extremely wise and knowledgeable. The nymph seemed to have an unrivaled ability to store information and to understand the nature of things, hence why they seemed to love nature so much. The nymph Ayalea had much knowledge of nature and how nature worked, being able to describe to Fontenberrys her own knowledge of the deep woodland and animal inhabitants. Apparently knowing more and knowing things in greater detail than the Bosmer scholars that uh, our research had met. She also taught him of flowers and ghosts and of all the creatures inhabiting Tamriel too small and too timid for mortals to ever see because nymphs live a very long time, perhaps even being immortal as they call humans and elves mortals, meaning that they themselves may be immortal and spend their whole lives learning about nature and everything in their surroundings. Fondenberis describes that Ayalea taught him how to learn again for the very first time, of how to open his mind to all the possibilities of life and not having himself be limited by his own way of thinking. He ends his research by giving the recommendation to anyone who would ever see a nymph to speak to her, as you could learn a lot. Now, the funny thing here is that his research ends with a note from the Imperial University saying, and I quote, Editor's note. The writer, Von Zumbaris, is no longer a scholar at the Imperial University. He deposited this manuscript and disappeared from the civilized world. His current whereabouts are unknown. Yeah, this uh, probably means that he went to live with the nymph and hopelessly fell in love like the stigma around nymphs ifs. That said, it is actually not recommended to speak to a nymph without preparations like the ones that von den Bauers took. If you don't know their language and are not extremely careful, nymphs are very dangerous creatures as they can only be hurt with silver weapons or better, and they are resistant to paralysis and poison and are able to cast spells that can make you fall asleep and drain your energy. Anyway, so what happened to the nymphs? The simple answer is Bethesda just retconned them, but let's not be that simple. First of all, I have my own theory as to why we haven't seen them since Daggerfall in any of the mainline games, because I think that after Von den Bears's research, people might have actually turned their head to the value of nymphs, especially since their hair in Daggerfall has alchemical properties. Meaning that the nymphs may have been hunted down for both their knowledge, their hair, and um, yeah, let's call it personal satisfaction. While that isn't too likely, nymph hunts could explain why we can't easily find them anymore in the remaining uh, mainline games and that the remaining nymphs isolated themselves even more from away from any place where no player could ever find them. But then there's the mystery of the Elder Scrolls Online, why don't we see them there centuries before Daggerfall and centuries before Von den Bears's research? Well, my friend Nerdragon theorized that perhaps during the second era there weren't as many nymphs as in the third era and that perhaps some type of event happened which caused them to procreate more, meaning that they became less rare and thus they were seen more often around the time of Daggerfall, meaning while well, during the time of the Elder Scrolls Online they are so rare that we don't see them anywhere, or perhaps we will see them in the next chapter as we're apparently going to some mysterious faraway islands, so yeah, maybe we'll see them. Yeah, I was wrong on that on the original video. We never ended up seeing the nymphs in the High Isle expansion, unfortunately. But that's basically all I can tell you about the nymphs. Next up, let's talk about the unicorns of Tamriel, which are quite a bit different from your regular fantasy unicorns. So, unicorns. They are creatures which seem very not Elder Scrolls. I mean, the Elder Scrolls has a lot of strange monsters and very much has its own identity when it comes to creatures. And when it takes something from other types of fantasy or fairy tales, think about, for example, the concept of a high elf, they tend to change it to a degree where it feels distinct from other types of fantasy and it feels Elder Scrolls. But... Then we have the unicorn. The unicorn is such a mainstream thing from general fantasy and fairy tales and yet it's one of the few things which on the surface does not seem to have changed at all that much from the mainstream concept of a unicorn from mainstream fantasy when it got translated into the Elder Scrolls. 
I mean, it's a majestic white horse with a long horn on its forehead, which has a spiral pattern on it. I mean, almost the exact way how a unicorn is portrayed in stuff like fairy tales, Harry Potter, and even Barbie. As I distinctly remember my little sister having this unicorn with her Barbie set, which looked exactly like this, essentially. So, yeah, on the surface, the Elder Scrolls Unicorn seems like it's nothing special, but the writers did create an interesting story around the unicorns in the Elder Scrolls universe, which sets it apart from mainstream fantasy, at least a bit. You see, in the Elder Scrolls universe, unicorns are actually Daedric creatures, which are native to the Oblivion Plane called the Hunting Grounds, which is the domain of the Daedric Prince Hercen, the Daedric Prince of the Hunt, Master of Beasts and Master of the Chase. His realm of the hunting grounds is essentially a realm of pure nature, thick forests combined with grassy plains and mountains, all populated by a variety of wildlife from deer to cattle to wolves to bears and some say even bigger predators. This entire ecosystem is designed by Hercene to be one big hunting ground where he and his followers whose souls have entered his realm can enjoy the thrills of the spectacular hunts together. Some of the more mundane wildlife inside the hunting grounds is actually taken from Tamriel into the hunting grounds, so into oblivion by her scene. But her scene has also created many of his own hunting prey, from far larger and stronger versions of regular animals to unicorns as some of the ultimate prey for the hunt. He created the unicorns as a hunting challenge, making them extremely fast and agile. Some of the unicorns that he created were said to have been faster on land than a dragon is in flight, shooting over the fields and through the forest like a silver stripe. They can jump over 9 feet high, and some apparently have wings or some other method of flight as they can somehow fly through the air. I mean, it's possible that Hercene created some variants which have wings for the extra challenge. Now, it can also handle itself well in combat against any who would trap it, as a long deadly horn made out of ivory, and in the cases of some other unicorns apparently even silver, that horn can deal deadly damage to hunters. And when the horn is damaged or destroyed in combat, it can even be regenerated again, usually in just a few minutes or even less. The interesting thing is that unicorns have become this mythical, almost deity-like creature for the people of Tamriel in their folktales, with many not even believing that they exist. But in Tamrielic folktales they have become almost these supernatural creatures of everything that's good and this sort of mythical enemy against the evil Daedra. This shows how the Elder Scrolls is so full of unreliable narrators, as this story that the people of Tamriel fabricated likely originated in the stories of the hunters in the forest seeing unicorns being chased by Hercene and his Daedric servants and followers, as sometimes Hercene and his aspects bring unicorns into Tamriel to hunt them in a very different and unpredictable forest. Which is also the reason why there are some but very few wild unicorns on Tamriel, since they are the ultimate hunting challenge. Some probably managed to escape and thus eventually made their home on Tamriel, after escaping from Hercene and his Daedric hunters in their hunt. I mean, there's a reason why Hercene calls them the last tamed, as they are a serious challenge in the hunt, even for him, a Daedric prince. But due to their elusive nature, very few mortals have actually seen one, and those who did were not often believed by their peers. And those who did believe the sightings rationalized that the creature must be on the verge of extinction, but they generally aren't, as they are simply not native to Tamriel, but were brought to Tamriel's ecosystems from the outside, especially for the hunt and for the pleasure of the Daedric prince Hercene. That does not mean that there haven't been any sightings or even mortals to bring unicorns down which escaped Hercene's hunt. A feat which can be used to instantly gain Hercene's respect by the way, since this is how a unicorn appears in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion as a creature to hunt down by the player so that the player can offer its horn to Hercene to gain his favor and thus a Daedric artifact. But that horn, I mean, it's almost a waste to present it to her scene. Unicorn horns are extremely rare and very much sought after for its strong alchemical properties and sometimes just as a status symbol, fetching enormous prices when offered to nobles who would just like to have it for themselves. A bit of a shame that that's not an option in Oblivion as a greedy roleplay character would definitely want to do that, but never mind. That being said, that's basically all that we have on the unicorns. They are pretty interesting creatures and make even an appearance in Skyrim's Creation Club DLC. With this creation specifically being made by modders and not by Bethesda themselves. Now, I usually consider Creation Club content worth a mention, but the story of this one is very strange, considering that all the other lore around unicorns doesn't really tend to match up with it. I don't mean to offend anyone with this video, but the modder who made this was likely not too much up to speed with the lore around unicorns, even though he's a very talented modder, but yeah, I don't consider it canon. 
The plot of this creation revolves around a unicorn which was sighted in Skyrim, which was apparently a unicorn transported into the future by the Sigic Order so that the unicorns would not go extinct. And then the Dragonborn tames one. Um, yeah, pretty weak tea, to be honest. But, you know, Creation Club stuff tends to be very hit or miss on lore friendliness depending on which modder made the content. Anyway, that was basically all the information that I was able to give you on unicorns. Now, let's talk about griffins. So, griffins. Griffins are large winged animals which seem to be a fusion of lions with eagles. They often appear not only in fantasy stories but also in real life ancient myths where in some civilizations like Egypt and even Greece they were part of religious myths for a very long time. In the Elder Scrolls universe we can also come across them, specifically around southwestern Tamriel as most griffins live on the Somerset Isles, although both elsewhere and High Rock and even in some sources Valenwood hold smaller griffin populations, with the biggest of these smaller populations by far being in elsewhere where you could say that an actual griffin colony has uh, taken root, at least around the second era. And considering that griffins actually play a role in some Yokudan iconography, but they do not seem to have a colony in Hammerfell strangely, it's not too strange to speculate that they may also live on the remains of Yokuda or lived in Yokuda before its fall. There's also many different types of griffin in the Elder Scrolls universe, from the snow white snow cap griffin, which lives on the highest mountain peaks in the snow of the Somerset Isles, to the blue and white pale plume griffin, and even the fire point griffin, which have their distinct red head and tail, which is mostly found in elsewhere. We also have the Scald Muse Griffin, which has an even more vibrant set of colors than the elsewhere Fireprint Griffin, but we don't really know where their origins lie or really where any of the specific colors originate other than the Firepoint Griffin and the Snowcap Griffin. You also have the regular Brown Griffin, and they mostly seem to originate on the Somerset Isles and also seem to actually be in other places, so that's the most common type of griffin. But again, we don't really know where they originate. The best recorded origins of just griffins in general, so not the specific types, uh, lies on the Somerset Isles, however, specifically Alinor, where they were first seen in recorded history by the settling Aldmer after their exodus from their home continent of Aldmeris. It's said that ever since the Aldmer saw these majestic creatures glide across the sky in the earliest times, as they fought against the, the then really harsh climate of the Somerset Isles, they dreamed of taming the creatures and riding them across the sky. However, griffins are mighty and wild creatures, which would prove to be untamable for the early Aldmer, despite generations of them trying to tame them. Griffins have very strong wills, which are not easily bent, and they can be very aggressive, especially when protecting their nests or their young fledglings. And because they are carnivores with a very wide range of appetites, many an Aldmer got straight up eaten by them as they attempted to tame them. Especially since the early Aldmer eradicated the early dangers from the Somerset Isles in those years, which the sources that we do have from before clearly recorded history describe as demons, but were likely just very dangerous animals, griffins quickly rose through the food chain, and as of recorded history they are among the predators at the top of the food chain on the Somerset Isles when they are grown up adults, although their young fledglings are very nice meals for lions and walruses among other creatures if they can get to them when their parents are not around, of course. Which actually can happen, as griffins are hunters, and they could be away from their nests to get food for their fledglings. Food which they then tend to drag back to their nests for their fledglings to eat and pick clean. As hunters, they tend to have a relatively strong territorial hunting tendency. They will generally hunt in a specific area, eating most anything that they can find, that's meat from farmer livestock like cows and pigs to wild animals, although curiously they do not seem to mind the presence of other griffins on their hunting ground, if we can use the game as a reliable source, as we can spot different seemingly non-related griffins living very close to one another. So it does seem that griffins tend to respect and not eat other griffins, rather focusing their hunting on the outside world and the animals within it. It also seems that they do not eat their own, not even their own discarded young, which is what we see with some animals in our own world, where if a young is discarded they get eaten by the rest. You see, some griffins may be born with a birth defect called wing rot, which prevents them from flying. If a fledgling has this defect, they are generally not eaten, but rather they are just cast out of the nest, which generally leads to them being eaten by other predators, as they cannot fly yet, or they won't ever be able to fly. Although, around the second era there are those who keep those cast out griffins either as pets or keep them in conservatories, hoping to cure them from their wing rot. 
That said, their hunting and nesting grounds are generally in the mountains and rocky areas, as they generally make their nests on either very inaccessible high peaks and cliffs to decrease accessibility for other predators that do not have wings like them, or they shelter their nests by rocks to camouflage their nests. This is also why in part it took so long for the griffins to eventually get tamed as adult wild griffins are just outright impossible to tame. But fledgling griffins that are hatched from eggs which are hatched away from their parents are actually able to be tamed. But it took a long while for the Almer to find this out as the griffin eggs are notoriously hard to obtain due to the ferocity of the parents and the locations of the nests being hard to access. And even when the ancient Aldmer were able to get their hands on these eggs, so griffin eggs, which were taken from the nest, they are very hard to hatch. Generations of Aldmer tried to hatch the eggs, but no matter their patience and the conditions that they kept the eggs in, none would hatch. Uh, the only reason why the eggs kept being taken from the nest at one point was to be eaten as royal delicacies at banquets uh, of the early clan kings and queens of the Summer Isles, as the Aldmer had all but given up on ever hatching them, them themselves. However, one day a method was found to hatch them, purely by accident actually. The Altmer clan king, Olorome, who would find an abandoned griffin egg after he and his tribe likely hunted down its parents for sport or for meat, wanted to prepare the egg for consumption. He placed it in a cooking fire and the tribe would then sing before the grand meals to bless the meal. But this singing had an unexpected result. The warm temperatures of the fire in combination with the pure singing voices of these early Aldmer led to the egg hatching and a young fledgling griffin emerging from the flames like a phoenix with its red wings. Olorome would take the fledgling in its hands and name it Sel Hinwe, a name which I could not find the canon meaning of, but someone online claimed it meant something like kingly gift of the fire or something like that, but I could not verify that for the life of me, so don't hold it against me. Literally, I spent, I think, a quarter of my research time trying to verify that, but I couldn't. Interestingly, as a side note, this birth of Sel Hinwe is the only mention in lore of phoenixes in the Elder Scrolls, uh, other than some item names. Uh, I would like to make a lore video on phoenixes when I read this, but there's no lore on them I could find. I mean, just so you know, and you're not going to ask me, make a lore video about phoenixes. Anyway, Sel Hinwe would grow up as a mighty ally of Lord Olorome, who would become the eventual lord of the settlement which would grow into the city of Sunhold, and his lineage would deliver Sunhold's future kin lords and kin ladies, so the rulers of that city, with the descendants of Sel Hinwe being their bound companions to a point where the kin lords Griffin would become Sunhold's most recognizable symbol around the Isles as its mighty protector. And actually, Sel Hinwe's far descendant, Sunnawell, and his kin lady would eventually play a role in the fall of Sunhold, on which I made a video, which is in the description for those wanting to know more about that. So, after Lord Olorome first tamed the griffin this way, many elves have tried, with only very few succeeding. But those who did succeed almost universally were or became mighty warriors with their griffin companion at their side. For example, we also have evidence that tamed griffins were the mounts of ancient alien warrior kings, or at least some of them, after the exodus of some Aldmer to Cyrodiil, who would eventually become the alien elves. Although the descendants of these griffins taken by the aliens are now nowhere to be seen since the human imperials gained control. And thus they are likely extinct by now or living only on the highest peaks of the mountains of Cyril, far away from humanity. As that is how the snow-capped griffins actually remained a legend among the Altmer for a very long time back in the Meretic era. As nobody had seen these uh, snow-white griffins since they lived very high on the mountains actually camouflaged themselves in the clouds when they flew away. Anyway, having a griffin as your companion gives you unrivaled mobility compared to other warriors flying almost everywhere at a moment's notice and fleeing from battlefields, the quickest of them all. This is why the Welkenar Knights, extremely strong protectors of the Somerset Isles that are based in the Sea of Cloudrest, use the griffins exclusively as their mount and their companion. I made a video on this as well a while back, so I recommend watching that video for full information about their order and how they use their griffins. But something interesting to take from their story in regards to griffins is that their story shows that the griffins actually possess extreme intelligence and their mental capacity is pretty good when it's trained. Because during their training with the Welkenar Knights, when they hatch a griffin egg, they, so the rider and the fledgling griffin, both undergo magical rituals to enhance their bonds to a point where the griffin and the knight fully understand each other and actually become an extension of one another with their feelings. 
with Griffins being able to this way understand very complicated commands and do very complicated tasks. Whether or not this intelligence is unlocked by those rituals or whether wild Griffins possess a similar intelligence is unknown. Um, but yeah, watch that video on the Welkinar Knights for more information about that because I do not like repeating myself. Anyway, it's not just those knightly orders and big uh, powerful kings and powerful warriors that can hatch and train uh, Griffins, as we have seen other examples during history, but it's very hard to do. So usually the ones that do have uh, a Griffin as their companion are usually very powerful warriors or mighty kings or those kind of figures. But yeah, that's basically all I can tell you about Griffins. Now let's move on to a much smaller creature, Mud Crabs. So Mud Crabs, probably one of the creatures most encountered all around Tamriel. They're a very common sight in basically every mainline Elder Scrolls games and are, let's say, not the strongest or most fearsome type of enemy. Most people would likely write them off immediately saying that they're just crabs and not that interesting. But they do in fact have some lore to them which I'd like to explore today. So let's start talking about their basic behavior patterns. Um, mud crabs tend to live by rivers and when they are not active bury themselves in the sand in hope of camouflaging themselves as a rock, specifically when they sleep in hopes of being unseen by bigger predators. There are many different types of mud crab found all around Tamriel with some looking more like rocks and some looking more like conventional crabs. There's even those in coastal regions which don't look like rocks at all but rather look like coral like the one that you see on screen right now. Uh, mud crabs are generally non-aggressive creatures unless they are threatened, cornered or provoked according to the lore. Although in the games we do get plenty of examples of mud crabs attacking unprovoked. And that's because according to an Elder Scrolls Online lore book, mud crabs are highly territorial. They tend to claim parts of the coast or rivers to be their own, uh, or that of their groups as some of them live in groups. And when that territory is breached by something or someone that they perceive as a threat, they will fearlessly attack the intruder, even if they realistically stand absolutely no chance against them in combat. According to some in-universe scholars, mud crabs even have an overblown combat prowess, thinking greater of themselves than they actually are. With this I mean that they attack intruders with the genuine idea that they're going to win. This is unlike some animals in nature which will only attack out of genuine self defense and desperation knowing that they won't win. I like that, you know, the idea of mud crabs. If they could speak, they would be a bit like the Black Knight from Monty Python and just never give up going like... Come on then! What? Have at you! Because of this battle prowess, mud crabs will also often fight other animals with their sharp pincers and in the case when it's hungry, go out for food hunting. As they are carnivores. In their hunting parties they can be a real nuisance to farmers as with enough crabs a mud crab herd or a mud crab clutch as groups of them are called can kill and devour cows, pigs and other livestock leading to some farmers living close to rivers getting real headaches out of them. However if there are no farms nearby to raid or other animals on the land or fish in the water to hunt uh, mud crabs have shown to be cannibalistic in certain cases. That said, not all mud crabs are aggressive to Tamriel's travelers, as some types, like the common mud crab that we see in the Elder Scrolls Online, the smallest type, doesn't seem to see the player as a threat and will not attack unless provoked directly. But the interesting thing here is that the bigger the mud crab gets, the more aggressive it seems to be to players. This leads me to believe that the small mud crabs that are not as aggressive see the player not as really a threat to their territory unless attacked as the player is so much bigger and concerns themselves with different things than the mud crab and thus the crab doesn't really see the player as a threat to its own goals and to its own territory because it seems that the mud crabs like pigeons for example in our world can get used to humans and not perceive them as a threat and there's this specific text by an in-universe scholar who spend a long time studying a clutch of mud crabs by a river and while aggressive at first, once they perceived him not to be a threat to their territory, they literally paint him no mind and just saw him as a part of their territory as he could even pet them and they didn't even react to him. While that same clutch did react violently to a bear breaching their territory, managing to scare the bear off as they had strength in numbers. But the interesting thing here is that once mud crabs don't see someone as a threat, they can even be, you know, taken as pets as they don't pay any mind to you. Even though you still need to be careful just to not provoke them and have them perceive you as a threat. 
Anyway, mud grubs when you attack them are generally not that strong, save for some very small exceptions like the gigantic mud crab or specific mud crab bosses uh, created by the de developers. This means that even though they are a nuisance to farmers, a farmer can easily, you know, with take his family and just take a couple of pitchforks and take a, out a clutch of mud crabs all by themselves. And once they have been taken out, there are some interesting uses to them, as their chitin and meat have been shown both to be edible and the chitin and legs specifically holding some alchemical properties, and certain mud crab variants even carrying poison in their pincers. That said, we don't really know the complete origin of mud crabs. Uh, however, one theory states that they are descendants of the gigantic emperor land crabs, which crawled across northern Tamriel back in the Dawn and Meretic eras. They were gigantic intelligent creatures with, according to an unreliable narrator, divine pursuits. But then at some point they gave up these divine pursuits and so they slowly devolved into the mud crabs that we know today. That said, in early Chimer history, the Chimer even hunted these Emperor Crabs and apparently quite successfully taken quite some of them down. This could mean that they're devolving into the Mud Crabs, which is generally believed, um, but not 100% certain that that's the case, that they devolved into the Mud Crabs. That maybe came out of a necessity to poke procreate quicker and evade hunters, or perhaps the mud Emperor Mud Crabs, the bigger ones were all hunted down and only the smaller ones remain. We don't actually know that for certain. But what we do know is that one of the larger emperor crabs now forms the central hall for the city of Aldrun, where the Dunmer live in the gigantic carapace. And in Skyrim's Creation Club fishing extension, we can even see a gigantic emperor crab ghost. And according to Make the Liar, they aren't actually extinct and that they can still be found in the deepest part of the oceans that they've maybe been, if that's the case, <laughs> if that, 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 that they've just been, you know, fleeing there after being hunted on Tamriel. But I don't know how much truth there is to that, as after all, Maik is a liar. Anyway, more on the Emperor Crab in my video on sea monsters of Tamriel's oceans, which is in the description of this video. Anyway, back to mud crabs. It's shown that mud crabs, like their ancestors, um, the ancient Emperor Crab, are capable of showing some intelligence, with some even showing higher intelligence, like the talking mud crab merchant from Morrowind who has a drinking problem, but that mud crab could also just be a gag and not really accurate lore. Uh, but we're doing this video, so I'm mentioning it, because there doesn't seem to be much more to mention. Alright, with mud crabs behind us, let's take a look at two creatures which are on the surface two sides of the same coin. The Golden Saints and Dark Seducers of the Daedric Prince of Madness, Sheogorath. So, the Golden Saints, or Aureoles as they call themselves, are Daedric servants of the Daedric Prince Sheogorath, the Daedric Prince of Madness. They make up one half of his army of servants, with the other half of his army being the Dark Seducers, or Maskin as they call themselves, who are the eternal rivals of the Golden Saints. They are designed to be almost angelic creatures, with golden skin and elf-like ears, almost like high elves, except they have green eyes with vertical pupils, almost like a cat, and they are very tall, averaging around 6 feet. Everything in their outfit is designed to complement their angelic design, making them look like benevolent beings, which they are absolutely not, as the Golden Saints are extremely arrogant and proud creatures, which do not care at all for mortals, as they see themselves as way higher beings. Despite this, they are fiercely loyal to the Daedric Prince Sheogorath, and they are ever in a quest to gain his favor over the Dark Seducers. Their drive to prove their loyalty is so great that sometimes they engrave their teeth with Sheogorath's three faces of madness, which are essentially his symbols. They are a heavily militaristic society, strongly adhering to the principles of duty and honor. Their battle prowess is legendary, as they are much stronger physically than mortals, and their weapons and armor are all of the extremely strong variety, with their equipment all being made out of pure gold and moonstone, which is mixed into an alloy that's stronger than steel and requires the heart of a Daedra to produce. With the production process driving any mortal who tries to replicate it mad, it's almost like everything in the Shivering Isles essentially. As one half of Sheogorath's Daedric army, the Golden Saints are the protectors of the northern half of the Shivering Isles, the so-called Dukedom of Mania. They serve it as its law enforcement and protection, serving the mortal Duke or Duchess of Mania and protecting the citizenry. The ironic thing is that while they protect mortals and even serve a mortal Duke, because they have been commanded by Sheogorath, they really don't care for mortals at all as we talked about and they don't even try to hide it as they are quite aggressive and unfriendly to the mortals that they tend to 
and they tend to have a very strong temper when interacting with mortals, being extremely quick to lash out against mortals and to punish them when just one of the citizens of Mania has done something wrong, truly preferring not to take prisoners but rather just murder mortals who have broken the laws of Mania. Unfortunately for them, as we established, they are constantly fighting to prove themselves to be the most loyal servants of Shiogora, trying to get in its favor over their rivals, the Dark Seducers. This means they have to follow his orders and Shiogorath has ordered them to listen to the mortal Duke or Duchess of Mania, who generally has laid out laws that prisoners need to be taken in, meaning that the Golden Saints reluctantly do take prisoners and don't just murder lawbreakers. Something interesting is that in their society women are way more important than men, men are looked down upon and the women hold all the power and have the most prestige. That isn't to say that they don't have men in their society, they do, but the males are just seen as lesser due to their clouded judgement and get no important positions of power and are basically seen as cannon fodder in war. Interestingly enough, the males also tend to be shorter than the females, adding to their inferiority in Oriole society. Men are so inferior in their society that in their military hierarchy basically the highest ranking male is less important than the lowest ranking female who has the title of Aurin. And the highest ranking female, basically their highest commander, having the title of Armazel, with six other ranks in titles between the two. And men are all the way down below the Aurin, something which they seem to be fine with as even the men themselves see themselves as inferior. Now, in-universe scholars on Tamriel have speculated that the Golden Saints may not actually be originally from the Shivering Isles, but just ended up there and started serving Shiogorath. This seems unlikely to me personally, as they seem to have just been created by Shiogorath together with the Shivering Isles, as when they perish in battle, their souls are eventually returned to the Shivering Isles, where they are then reborn at the so-called Wellspring of the Oriole in their Font of Rebirth, which is located in the Shivering Isles, inside their ancestral home of Brelak, a large temple filled with underground halls. Now, in addition to patrolling the Shivering Isles, the Golden Saints are often sent out by Shiogorath into Tamriel and into other Daedric realms to do his bidding. We can find them in both Morwent and the Elder Scrolls Online as they are carrying out missions for Shiogorath. Another interesting tidbit is that just like other minor Daedra, Golden Saints are actually capable of being summoned by mortals in Tamriel if they have the right spells. In the Second Era, one Golden Saint was summoned by a mortal sorcerer to take the place of his dead wife, so his child could be raised by the Golden Saint. Uh, let's say curious choice considering their stance on mortals, but hey, it actually went pretty well. I talked about that story to a far greater extent in my video on the mortal mage who was raised by the Daedra, Malper for loss. That video is in the description in case you want to hear that story, but for now that's all I can tell you about the Golden Saints. Now let's talk about their counterparts, the Dark Seducers. So, the Dark Seducers, or Masken as they call themselves, are they are Daedric servants of the Daedric Prince Shiogorath, the Prince of Madness. They make up the other half of his army of servants, with the first half of his army being the Golden Saints, or Aureoles, who are the internal rivals of the Dark Seducers. Now, I already made a video on the Golden Saints, so if you want to know more about them, you should click on the link in the description. But as you'll see, the Dark Seducers are almost the polar opposites of the Golden Saints in quite a few areas, although there are some striking similarities between the two races, as you'll see. For starters, while the Golden Saints are designed to be these angelic-looking creatures, the Dark Seducers look far more demonic in their appearance, with a dark purplish skin tone and unnaturally light eyes. However, just like how the Golden Saints are nothing like their appearance personality-wise, as those benevolent-looking creatures are extremely arrogant and cruel when dealing with mortals, the Dark Seducers are actually quite gentle and far more patient with mortals than their golden-skinned counterparts. Although they do see themselves as superior to mortals, and they do not enjoy being subservient to a mortal, and when angered, they are absolutely not above killing mortals. And you really don't want to anger them, as when they do get angry and want to elicit pain, they tend to do it slowly and painfully, unlike the Golden Saints, which simply kill mortals quickly and efficiently, considering them not really worth their time. Now, physically, the Dark Seducers are far stronger than your average mortal and their armor and equipment is being rated as extremely sturdy and far above the quality of mortal weaponry and armor. And as you've probably noticed, their armor doesn't really cover all that much. Just like the lore on the armor, because according to the lore that we have, the reason for this armor being so 
lightly armored let's say it that way is so that they can use their speed and nimbleness in combat and they aren't overburdened by heavy armor that will slow them down in their movement while still being protected in some crucial areas why you would then leave your stomach exposed is beyond me but i suppose it's not my job to question decisions made by bethesda designers in the 90s that having been said, just like the Golden Saints, they live in a heavily militaristic and rigid society where one's rank determines how much respect you get and with the male Dark Seducers not being able to get any of the important ranks. As males in their society, just like with the Golden Saints, are seen as inferior and weaker. Which they are by the way, looking at their stats. This is why men in their society, which is based on strength and prowess are looked down upon for their weakness and bad judgment and therefore have very little to say in dark seducer society and are usually just used as cannon fodder in their many wars against the golden saints because while each of the two races has been assigned to guard one half of Shiagorath's realm of the Shivering Isles, with the Golden Saints guarding the northern half called Mania and the Dark Seducers guarding the southern half called Dementia, both races continually compete against each other for Shiagorath's favor, trying to prove the other side's inferiority to the Mad God so that they become their favorites. This means that for eons they have basically been locked into conflict, often fighting lengthy battles, sometimes for centuries against one another. But despite his eccentricities, it seems that Shiagorath Gorath is not really in the business of picking favorites, as both of the races have had their own unique strengths and weaknesses, which he can then use to have them carry out his business on Tamriel and the other planes of existence. For example, a power that the Dark Seducers have is that of Disguise. They can magically disguise themselves as any of the mortal races, usually picking a specific attractive disguise in order to seduce mortals and lure them into a trap. That tactic, along with their quite honestly revealing appearance in their normal form, led mortals to give them the name Dark Seducers. As I said in the beginning, they don't call themselves Dark Seducers. They call themselves the Maskin instead of Dark Seducers, so it's basically a name that mortals gave to them based on their tactics and their appearance. Now, while the Golden Saints are basically just soldiers in most respect, the power of transformation and seduction that the Dark Seducers have is quite useful. And that's not just something that Shiogorath has seen, as multiple Daedric Princes have their own variants of Dark Seducers. One lore explanation that's been given to us is that because the Dark Seducers are a little less proud and a little less blindly loyal to Shiogorath, there are actually quite a few so-called clanless Dark Seducers. These are Maskin that aren't loyal to Shiogorath and some of these then get scooped up by other Daedric Princes like Merun's Dagon, who strip them of their independence and then make servants out of them, likely by changing their true names. Now, if that sounds vague, in short, every Daedric creature has a true name, which is made up of a set of words called Nimics, which describe everything about a Daedric creature, from their personality to body shape to powers to allegiance. This true name, or set of Nimics, functions almost like a genetic code along which Daedra can be reformed in Oblivion after they've been slain. But these Nimics can also be changed, in order to forcibly change their allegiance, powers or body shape, for example. This is likely also the explanation why the Dark Seducers employed by Mehrunes Dagon have demonic wings and are far more cruel than their counterparts in the Shivering Isles, because their true names have been changed by the Prince of Destruction. Now, that whole Nimic or true name business is quite complicated, which is why I dedicated a full video on it, so watch that if you want to learn more about the true nature of Daedra. But for now, all you truly need to know is that this set of Nimics almost functions like that genetic code that I mentioned, which can be used to reform or bring back a slain Dark Seducer. This happens in the Shivering Isles at the Wellspring of the Maskin, a place where the slain are brought back exactly as they were upon death. Now, we can assume that those Dark Seducers who were changed to serve other Daedric Princes do not return there, as likely their Nimics have been changed in such a way that their place of rebirth has also been changed to a place in another Daedric Prince's realm, which they then serve. But we don't really know that, unfortunately. Something else that we don't know is whether or not Shiogorath was even their true creator, because in-universe scholars on Tamriel, just like with the Golden Saints, have speculated that the Dark Seducers may not actually originally been born in the Shivering Isles, but just ended up there and then started serving Shiogorath for some undefined reason. Now, to me this seems pretty unlikely, as they seem to have just been created by Shiogorath together with the Shivering Isles and the Golden Saints, because as far as we are aware, his Dark Seducers, they are the original Dark Seducers, the one that should serve Shiogorath. While those serving other Daedric Princes are either those who have been changed or are copies made by other Princes based on the Nimics of those that they already changed. But that's just a piece of speculation on my part. And we don't even know what happens to the independent Maskin, so the ones that don't serve any Daedric Prince and have been scooped up by any of the other Princes. Because, for example, we have 
unaligned Dark Seducers like Madame Wim in Fargrave in the Elder Scrolls Online. So yeah, we don't really know what happens to them when they are slain, but considering that none of their Nimics have been changed, probably other than their allegiance to Sheogorath, it's pretty likely that they'll still get back to the Shivering Isles when they are slain, but that's just also speculation on my part. Alright, having talked about the Dark Seducers and the Golden Saints, let's now go from powerful Deja creatures to a weak yet amazing creature, the Chub Loon, Tamriel's Penguin. Although I have been told in the comments of the original video that the animal that the Chub Loon is based on, the Great Auk, isn't actually a penguin. Alright, let's talk about the Chub Loon anyway. So, the Chub Loon, a penguin like creature which, according to the lore book, the mystery of the Chub Loon, quote unquote, serves no purpose. But. Their story is a bit more interesting than you may think, because yes, just like penguins, they waddle around cutely, they dive into the oceans and swim there to get fishies, and just like penguins, on cold days they huddle together as a group uh, to provide each other warmth. Very cute, but there's more to them than just they are cute penguins. For starters, these stud-legged flightless creatures live on the northern coast of Tamriel, with the standard chub loon with its black and white feathers and dark beak making its home on the rocky cliff coasts of northern High Rock and Skyrim. There are other variants of the chub loon which exist as pets for you to buy in the Elder Scrolls Online Crown Store, which both originate in the lore from the more southern parts of the High Rock coast although we do not encounter them in the game. These are the Hay Crown Chubloon, which has the color scheme of an Emperor Penguin, just like with the little crown on its head, and the Fell Brown Chubloon, which has brown feathers and a blue beak. Um, now these two variants are apparently extinct, because we don't encounter them anywhere else in the game, except for in the Crown Store as pets. Now, the more interesting and final variant of the Chubloon to exist in the game is the Abmoran Chubloon, which has all white feathers and a blue beak, which is perfect camouflage for the icy tundras of Admora. And this variant of Chubloon actually gives us somewhat of a hint as to their origins, as we learn from the book The Mystery of the Chubloon, that before the start of the Second Era there are no records of any Chubloon existing on Tamriel, and that one day they just showed up in historical records as a species and they apparently have come from the sea when they suddenly started to show up, likely having migrated from Admora, uh, which is the ancestral home of most of the human races and a continent currently experiencing an ice age of sorts, as it's been completely frozen over and no humans remain there. And perhaps that's why the Chubloon also eventually migrated, as thousands of years after the humans migrated, perhaps it became even colder and the seas became so inhospitable that even the fish that the Chubloon eats maybe might not survive there, which is maybe why the Chubloon might have migrated to the south, to Tamriel, but that's just speculation on my part. But we do know that despite the Chubloon being quite clumsy on land and literally unable to defend itself against, well, basically anything, it disrupts entire ecosystems, as in the sea it's one of the best fish hunters of the north, meaning that other species living from the ocean's fish suddenly had a lot less to eat when the Chubloon suddenly shows up. This is why once a colony of Chubloon establishes itself on the cliffs of a part of the coastline, for example the Horkers of Tamriel, despite being a thousand times stronger than the Chubloon, get forced out of the habitat as they have far less fish available to them to survive, as the Chubloon managed to efficiently hunt down the fish that the Horkers might have otherwise eaten. And while a logical solution for the Horkers might be to just, you know, start eating Chubloon, that ain't happening as the Chubloon are far more agile in the water than Horkers and are just very hard to catch and their nests are on high rocks and cliffs, meaning that the Horkers can hardly reach them. So the Horkers get supplanted in the ecosystem and are literally forced out to move to other coasts. Now, this does not mean that nothing can hunt the Chubloon because they are very clumsy. Because the orcs of Northern High Rock have been hunting these creatures basically since they arrived, as they discovered that their grilled meat tastes really good with some moon sugar glaze and citrus. And here we have an example of them being not that smart and a bit clumsy, because while after some years they finally caught on to the fact that the orcs of Orsinium hunt them for their delicious meat, they don't run from any humans, Khajiit or Argonians or any other elves than the orcs for that matter apparently. And they just allow themselves to be pucked up and padded because they don't see humans or any humanoids as a threat except for the orcs which they started to see as a threat after years of being hunted by them. And thus hunting them for other races than the orcs is really easy because by now they finally flee for orcs when they see or smell one but the other races they don't really care about. 
Now, we don't really know much more about these creatures as I covered basically all the stated lore that we have on them, but there is some more information we should cover. Because first of all, there is a legend about Chubloons in the lore that they were once massive creatures, almost twice as big as human warriors. Back in the Mretic era on Edmora, that's basically when this whole massive stage of these creatures apparently took place, mighty warriors like Isgrimoire wrestled these things as a challenge apparently, which could take a whole day to subdue one of the Chubloon for even the mightiest of warriors. That's probably just a legend and an exaggerated children's story, which probably originates from like warriors wrestling with some other mighty creature at the coast and then the story became distorted and the Chubloon somehow became involved over the years of oral storytelling. But still, it's an interesting story. And second, we don't really know what happened to them, because by the time of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, there are no more Chubloon on the coast. Uh, we don't know why, perhaps the Nords also called on to them being really delicious and just hunted them all down. Or perhaps, just like they migrated from Admora to Tamriel, the Chubloon once again mass migrated away, perhaps back to Admora, as maybe by the time of Skyrim the continent has become habitable again for fish, and thus the Chubloon, as their source of food is back. But considering that they're heavily based on the real-life Great Orc Penguin, which is extinct in real world, I think they are extinct by now, because that's what they were inspired by. But it's also possible that they are not extinct and that the creator simply picked this type of penguin as their inspiration, because not many would recognize this type of penguin as a regular penguin, and thus they would become a bit more distinct for the Elder Scrolls world. We don't actually know what kind of choices they made on that. But they are heavily based on this penguin type, with many of its mannerisms and its habitat being identical, so it's not a great stretch to think that many of the traits that we don't find in the lore in the Elder Scrolls for the Chubloon, such as its procreation method, are simply the same as that of the Great Auk, because that's what it was inspired by. So if you for some reason want more headcanon lore on the Chubloon, which is probably correct, Check the Wikipedia page for the Great Auk, as it's basically the same creature. Although, like I said at the beginning of this section, people at the time told me that the Great Auk is not a penguin. But yeah, still heavily based on it. Anyway, let's now talk about the Gehenoth, Skyrim's missing terror, a creature which exists in the lore, but was never present in Skyrim, and yet is extremely interesting and a terror in its own right, and a shame that they didn't include it in The Elder Scrolls V. So, the Gehenoth. It's a creature which only appeared in a very obscure game of the Elder Scrolls series, The Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar. In that game, the Gehenoth is a monster type which appears in the game and roams the snowy fields around the city of Dawnstar. It specifically hunts at night, targeting sleeping travelers, and as such is feared by the people of Dawnstar, who give travelers the advice to always run, as nobody except for exceptional mortals are able to defeat this monstrous creature. In Dawnstar it functions as this sort of horror or terror beyond the walls that everybody fears. And I don't know, I just think that's kind of cool. Because we don't see that often in Elder Scrolls games. They don't seem to hunt in packs and rather hunt alone. And they fight their enemies with melee attacks that can freeze their enemies as well. Now we know that they do have quite a sizable population as this enemy isn't rare per se or unique. As you can come across more of them after defeating them. And one exceptionally strong Gehenoth is the final boss of the game, which is the unique Gehenoth Trisborn, which has a more brownish set of scales and is by far the strongest enemy in that game. But here's the thing, that's about all the solid information that we have on the Gehenoth. You see, Bethesda just introduced it as one of their biggest predators of Skyrim. The people of Skyrim are absolutely terrified of encountering one at night, and on top of that it has a pretty cool design, in my opinion. And... Yeah, it's just a big and threatening predator that has a really unique design and then they just never use it again. But if you think this is where the video ends, you've clearly never watched my videos before, as, well, explaining away Bethesda's retcons is basically my day job at this point, and I would not be making this video if I didn't have some interesting speculations and additional lore to present to you guys. You see, the main story of the Elder Scrolls Dawnstar is really short, but they have you just explore a lot of pretty useless dungeons to pad the game. So in short, the story is that you, the hero of Dawnstar, arrive in the city of Dawnstar, which is being besieged by these mysterious snow people. Uh, many people have assumed that these are the same people as the Ice Tribe, which we see in the Elder Scrolls Travel Shadow Gi, and many people in turn have speculated that these Ice Tribes may either be really early concepts for the Falmer that we see in Skyrim or the Reeklings we see in Skyrim's Dragonborn expansion. I personally lean towards the explanation that they may be early designs for Reeklings as they 
display some abilities to speak to the main races of Tamriel, something which the former seem unable to do. This means that it's likely that these people of the Ice Tribe are early designs for the Reeklings, which are at the time of the Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar besieging the city. Now, they were able to do this because one of the city's four champions has betrayed the city, although the governor doesn't know which one, so, you know, it's up to you, the player, to find out. Long story short, you find out who the traitor is, which interestingly changes every playthrough, they made it replayable, which is kinda nice. And once you find out, the Reeklings or the former attack en masse as the traitorous champion tries one last ditch effort to get things turned in their favor. Now during that attack, the special thrice-born Gehenith is with them, having allied with the Ice Tribe, which are either Reeklings or Falmer. Now this Gehenith is the strongest creature in the entire game and is likely an alpha of sorts in their population. This does show however that the Gehenith likely have some capabilities of communication with its fellow invaders in the form of the Ice Tribes and the Trolls which attack the city at that point because it was coordinating the attack with them. But this again shows that Gehenoths likely operate and hunt alone, because the Thriceborn Gehenoth is the only Gehenoth with the invading army, so there's likely no social structure in their population. Now, likely this means also that the Gehenoths are alone for most of their life, unless they need to mate. Uh, we do not have an example of a female Gehenoth and we don't know how they mate either. Um, anyway, the real question is, why was this enemy never used again, what happened to it and where did it come from? Well, as I said, we have covered now basically everything that we can deduct from the actual lore, but there are a few theories in that regard. Now, one theory that I've read a couple of times online, even though I couldn't find a single shred of evidence for it, is that the Gehenet may have been a result of either Dwemer or Ancient Falmer, so the Snow Elves, magical experimentations on trolls. Now, this theory goes that when the Falmer and the Dwemer were at war with the Nords, they quickly realized that they were losing out and just tried to create something even stronger than a troll to fight the Nords for them. Now, if this is the case, it's most logical for the Snow Elves to be the one to have done all the experimentation as the Dwemer could have just built another battle robot. Uh, this theory would explain why the Gehenoth would be willing to help the Ice Tribe if the Ice Tribe are indeed an early design of the Falmer that we see in Skyrim as it would explain why it's with them or even want to protect them in some way. Now, a second theory is that they are related to the Grawl or Ice Giants of Solstheim which we saw in both the Blood Moon expansion from Morrowind and more recently in the Elder Scrolls Legends' card. Now, this theory goes that the Gehenoths are an offshoot of a couple of Grawl that made it to the mainland and then evolved from them to become their own population. Combining this theory with the previous theory, it could also be that the Gehenoth is a result of Snow Elf experimentations on the Grawl, because we know that the Snow Elves also made it to Solstheim. Now, honestly, we just don't know. There's no lore on it, but I found these explanations to be interesting. But the most intriguing theory to me personally is that the Ice Tribe may not be Reeklings or Falmer at all, but rather Akaviri Kamal which is known to house a race of snow demons. So the Ice Tribe could have been the foot soldiers of that nation and the Gehenoth their infamous snow demons because these things are definitely demon-like. Now the idea is that these Ice Tribe and these demons are descendants of the Kamal invasion of Tamriel in the Second Era. Now the only problem with that theory is that in the Elder Scrolls Online uh, we only play a few years after the Kamal invasion of Tamriel and there are no Kamal to be found and the Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar takes place in the third era hundreds of years after their invasion and also hundreds of years after their last mention in Tamrielic history several hundred years after the Elder Scrolls Online uh, there were some remnant Kamal which joined up with the remaining Sacy on Tamriel to try and become Cyrodiil's rulers uh, that failed and after that we never heard of them anymore so to think that suddenly, hundreds of years later, they have enough numbers to besiege a city after they disappeared from Tamriel and its history seems unlikely. So to me, the first theory seems far more likely where the Gehenoths are failed experiments on trolls and then became their own population in the wilds of Northern Skyrim, just feared immensely by the population. And honestly, we just have no idea why they disappeared either, or why there aren't any in the Elder Scrolls Online. Now, the only outcome for that mystery would be if they are perhaps the result of a local sorcerer's more recent experiments on trolls or grawls somewhere in the Third Era. So a couple of years before the events of the Elder Scrolls Travels Dawnstar. It's possible that this sorcerer then just lost control of his creation and maybe they escaped from his lab and eventually got killed off by adventurers or soldiers after a few decades, after they, their population just shrank after adventurers or soldiers sold them out to just prove themselves or clear them out. Uh, which could explain why they are no longer there in the fourth era, but honestly the Gehenoth is probably just something Bethesda forgot, but that's a shame as I would have no idea why Bethesda never reused this awesome creature. Do let me know though what you thought of the Gehenoth, would you like to see it back in the future? I mean, 
I would. <laughs> I don't know. It's a kind of disgusting creature when you look at the sprite, but it's also kind of cool. And just the fact that it's kind of this horrorish scare beyond the walls. Um, I don't know. That would have added something cool to Skyrim. And that's why I wanted to tell this story in this video today. But that's basically all we know and some speculation on the Gehenneth. Now, from the Gehenneth, a creature missing from the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, let's now talk about another creature missing from the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, but which does appear in the lore on Skyrim's coasts, at least from time to time. The Sea Giant. So, the Sea Giant, a presumed distant cousin of Skyrim's regular giant, is a curious case. For one, they are much more intelligent than Skyrim's regular giants, as they are able to master multiple languages next to their own and are far more advanced craftsmen. While giants in Skyrim are quite primitive, the sea giants are able to build longships and create advanced tools, and they are even able to use a limited degree of magic. Further differences with their land cousins on Skyrim's tundras are that they have blue silvery skin and are even more resistant to the cold than regular giants. And unlike normal giants, sea giants are mostly creatures of legends as not many have actually seen them during their lifetime. You see, sea giants as their name suggests live on longboats in the Sea of Ghosts for most of the year and they very rarely make landfall on Tamriel. Only once every few years, small contingents of sea giants will make land on Tamriel. And it's even rarer for large groups to make landfall. When they do make landfall it's often during very cold winters that even they cannot weather and they often raid Nordic coastal villages if they come en masse which they have done a few times and if they come with really big groups they often raid bigger cities on the northern coasts like Solitude, Dawnstar and Winterhold. Although that happens so rarely that most Nords don't even tend to believe in the sea giants existence and see them as creatures of legends and fairy tales which do not actually exist and are just, you know, present in stories to scare children. But they very much do exist as like I said they have raided Skyrim's northern coast semi-regularly during its history and in the lore that we have it says that the legends of sea giants on Tamriel's northern coasts started around the middle of the first era which actually provides somewhat of a hint of where they could live but I'll get to that in a bit, because you see, the sources that we have, which are all written by Tamrielic peoples by the way, tell us that sea giants live on their gigantic longboats all year around and do not make landfall unless it's so cold that even they cannot go on sailing and the sea freezes around them. The people of Tamriel presume that the sea giants on their ships, which they allegedly live on all year round, feed themselves by hunting the whales of the northern sea and the extreme cold of the northern sea of ghosts doesn't bother them that much because of their extreme cold resistance, meaning that as long as they keep themselves fed with whale meat and presumably are able to drink salt water, I guess, uh, they can keep themselves going indefinitely at sea. But I personally have a different theory based on some evidence, because considering that we know that the continent of Atmora, which froze over and became completely unlivable for regular humans, despite being the original home continent of most races of humans, that continent is in the north of the Sea of Ghosts and that continent also allegedly had giants. And the story of sea giants started appearing for the first time in the middle of the first era, you know, when Atmora had semi just frozen. There's a strong chance that their main population, so the main population of sea giants, lives on Atmora's coasts, being able to weather the cold due to their extreme cold resistance and being able to live off the fish that they catch near the coasts. This also means that they could get non-salt water by melting Atmora's land snow and ice, solving that problem. Another strong indicator of them living in a place which at least used to be inhabited by humans is that in their raiding parties they bring a lot, and I mean a lot of half giants, which allegedly came about due to their breeding with humans. Considering how rare sightings of sea giants are on northern Skyrim, and thus not many Nords who have even seen them, and even less who would be able to breed with them, and even less who would have wanted that, it would make sense that these half giants, which seem to have inherited the cold resistance of the actual sea giants, are probably the longtime descendants of those humans who on Atmora breeded with these giants, leading to the half sea giants long before Atmora froze over. Or perhaps just as Atmora was freezing over, just, you know to give their own descendants a chance, but again, it all makes sense to me, but that's my speculation, since the only actual lore that we have is that they live all year round on their longboats, but that doesn't really make much sense to me personally, if only because of the salt water thing, so yeah, it's likely that they may live on Atmora, or at least what's left of Atmora, and likely then on Atmora's coast, considering that they mostly feed themselves with whales, and nothing grows anymore on frozen Atmora. That being said, due to their seafaring nature, they do spend a lot of time at sea and on the coasts. 
This can also be seen in their tools and in their clothes, as much of it is made with whalebone, horker hides, whale skin, and the large scales of a weird and unidentified sea creature that they seem to catch on. Though nobody on Tamriel seems to know what kind of creature those scales are on, but to get an idea, maybe watch my video on Tamriel Sea Monsters for an idea of what kind of creature that possibly could be. But more importantly, their tools being mostly made out of materials gathered while hunting out at sea shows that they have very little land resources to work with. In fact, when they raid Skyrim's most northern villages, they seem to rarely take any valuables. They mostly take wood, metal and other building materials that are probably really hard to come by wherever they live when they are off their ships, be it just the high seas on their ships all the time or at Mora like I speculated. Because they need these materials to maintain their longboats, as repairing your boat with whalebone might not be the best material to keep them floating. Now, considering that they also attack Nordic ships when they encounter them on the Sea of Ghosts, because Nordic sailors say that if you are a witness to seeing a sea giant, you won't survive to tell the tale. It's likely that they also repurpose the materials of enemy ships that they, you know, destroy to repair their own ships, trying to be as creative as they can with the little materials that they have. Strangely enough, it's even said that their weapons, especially harpoons, which are made out of whalebone, are of quite high quality, and that according to some on Tamriel, they are of better quality and they are lighter than some metal weapons on Tamriel, which is a pretty cool lore tidbit. Now it also seems that they are organized relatively primitively, they have chiefs, so they mostly likely live in really small communities like the orcs, although they also have titles like captain when on the high sea, so they might be more organized. We don't really know anything about the organization of their culture other than that the half giants do seem to be always subservient to the actual sea giants as they are usually seen serving the sea giants rather than a sea giant serving a half giant. So that's basically what we know about their culture. That being said, earlier in the video I spoke about their language, which I couldn't find much of in the lore resources in the game, but the UESP have actually compiled all the voice lines in their native language that we have, and they try to make sense of what their language is like. They discovered that their language shares some words with the language of regular giants, but is quite different overall, which actually makes sense considering how many generations these two distant cousin species have spent apart, if of course they are from Edmora. Now, we also know that during our playtime in the Elder Scrolls Online, there are a few places where we can encounter them, suggesting that the year 582 of the Second Era, when Elder Scrolls Online takes place, is a pretty cold year. As expected, we can find them raiding some villages along the very northern coast. We don't really know whether or not the sea giants became extinct by later eras, because in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim we don't see them anywhere, but considering that in the lore they only make landfall on Tamriel once in a few decades, it's pretty likely that they are still around, but they just aren't there that year and it's not a particularly cold year. But that's basically all I can tell you about sea giants for now. So let's move on to another creature, the Nereids, mystical mermaid-like creatures which live in and near bodies of water. In my original video I called them essentially Tamriel's mermaids and I still stand by that. So Nereids, also called water sprites or water nymphs, are mystical creatures that live near bodies of water that they are linked to and will protect. They look a bit like female elves, but with blue turquoise scaly skin, full lips, blue eyes and fin like ears. Some sources describe them as too beautiful for mortal eyes, and as we'll talk about later some mortals tend to fall in love with Nereids mirroring mermaid legends in our own universe. Now, Nereids function a bit like Spriggans, because just like how Spriggans tend to protect and take care of wooded groves and their wildlife, Nereids will do the same to ponds, springs and lagoons. They seem to prefer non-contaminated and flowing water, and generally they will not be aggressive to mortals unless they see them as a threat to the health of the ecosystem that they protect. Some Nereids, however, seem to be always aggressive to mortals, which I suppose could come from the fact that they see mortals in general as a threat to their ecosystems, considering what mortals generally tend to do to ecosystems, you know chop down trees, contaminate the water, that kind of thing. Because of this, some communities have negative legends about the Nereid, saying that they are simply vengeful spirits born from the bodies of women who were murdered and whose body was thrown into the water. While other communities have far more positive legends about the Nereids. Because the Nereids are apparently quite intelligent creatures and are able to learn mortal languages with some effort. We know that they are quite advanced in magic, having mastery over the strange and mysterious form of magic called water magic, which gives them control over the water and its properties. 
They can use simple water to heal creatures, which has led to communities forming around the ponds of good-natured nereids, where people come to the nereid to be healed from their ailments. And in some cases, mortals can even start to venerate the nereids for their power. But unlike other quite intelligent creatures, they don't really seem to build anything themselves or craft anything. They are known to adorn themselves in shells and surround themselves in water as some form of clothes with their water magic. But they don't seem to produce anything themselves. They do, however, use things that are left behind by mortals. For example, we know that nereids are quite fond of mortal jewelry, silver in particular. And they are known to inhabit the ruins of the houses of Tamriel's mortals if those ruins are close to their bodies of water. That being said, it seems like the Nereids are both fine to live by themselves and in groups. When they live in groups, they often live under a matriarch who leads the group, which is often called an Empress Nereid. But they also seem perfectly fine to live by themselves, especially when the body of water they are linked to is quite small. But this also has a negative side, as the smaller their pond is, the more vulnerable the Nereid is. As I touched upon earlier in the video, Nereids are linked to their body of water, and when I say linked, I mean that quite literally. Because if the water becomes poisoned or contaminated, the Nereid can die or become mentally corrupted. A good example is that during the Kanatan flu, one of Tamriel's worst diseases, a video on that is in the description if you want to see it, people sought out Nereids for a cure. However, there's an example of a Nereid curing so many people that the water of her pond became completely contaminated as sick people entered her water and slowly degraded its quality with their presence. This made the good-natured Nereid who wanted to cure them lose her mind and eventually become corrupted, leading her to become a vengeful creature looking to inflict and kill mortals as she became contaminated with the plague herself. The only way to then purify the pond would have been to kill the Nereid, as the corrupted Nereid no longer sought to nurture the water but rather sought it to keep it in its contaminated state. Pretty grim stuff to be honest. Now, when used responsibly, their control over water is astonishing. While some Nereids will wear mortal clothes, according to the lore most tend to prefer staying naked and shroud themselves in water instead, making sort of water clothed. Although we don't see this in the games, where for obvious reasons they have shell bras and tattered robes. That being said, they are perceived by the people of Tamriel to be quite attractive and they often sing an angelic transfixing song which can intoxicate mortals and is apparently especially intoxicating to men. One common trope can be how a man is seduced and then enthralled by the Nereid's call, not dissimilar to mermaid legends in our own world. The funny thing is though that in the poem where we learn this, it actually said that the Nereids don't really care for mortal men. Um, and rather the men are just entranced by their song, but they don't want anything to do with the men. Now, we don't know the origins of the Nereids, whether they are mortal, immortal, who created them, we have no idea. We don't even know how they procreate. Obviously some have speculated that they procreate with mortals, but that doesn't seem to be true. But considering some races view them as spirits and they are not dissimilar to Spriggans in their behavior, I think just like the Spriggans, their true origin will remain a bit of a mystery to us. Alright, so that's basically all that we know about Nereids. Now let's go to a type of creature which we haven't seen in any games yet, but has still some amazing lore around it. The fearsome Marsh Giants of Black Marsh. So a few months ago I was thinking about doing a video on the largest creatures that roam across Tamriel, say some fun things about how the giants from Skyrim aren't close to the largest creatures, and then give a quick summary of large creatures. Now, I never ended up doing that video, but one of the most interesting things I found as I was researching for that video was Black Marsh's Marsh Giant, colossal swamp behemoths roaming across the swamps of Black Marsh, leaving trails of broken trees in their wake. Now, we don't really know what they look like, but we do know that they are quite massive and that they're not related to Skyrim's giants at all, only getting the name giant because they're so large. They also don't seem to be related to these things, the Mire Gaunts, which are said to have been created by the Hist. Because the Marsh Giants aren't related to the Hist in any way. In fact, in-universe scholars have speculated that the Marsh Giants are in fact a distant cousin of the Spragan, who are a form of nature spirits. As such, I imagine them to be a bit like the generated images that you see on screen right now. Anyway, like the Spriggans, they are likely nature spirits, and as far as we know their intelligence is very similar to that of Spriggans. Which means that they're most likely a bit smarter than most animals, perhaps like the Spriggans they are even able to have their own primitive language, but they are less intelligent than the playable races. 
What we do know for sure is that their behavior is also similar to those springens. They fiercely protect the swamps that they live in against those who would do them harm, regularly killing lumberjacks and destroying camps if they come too close to the territory, and killing invasive creatures like saber cats which would upset the ecosystem inside their territory. They also fell dead trees, making room for new ones to grow, and they help manage the growth of mosses that are essential to the ecosystem and are actively rooting out invasive fungi from the ecosystem. So they could rightly be called the protectors of the swamp. Now, the Argonian population of Black Mars seems to peacefully coexist with the Mars giants for the most part, even forming a symbiotic relationship in some areas where the Mars giants walk around. Their feet make gigantic trembles in the earth because they are so heavy, making it so that fruit falls from the trees that they walk past, which the Argonians then can scoop up and eat. In addition to that, their white gnarled feet till the earth for the local Argonian communities, and if a Mars giant dies, its blood, which can apparently come in many different colors, can be used to make different inks and paints, although it seems like the Argonians don't seem to hunt the Mars giants, they are just harvesting the blood of those who fell outside of the Argonians doing. Interestingly enough, the most traditional and tribal Argonians tend to stay far away from the Mars giants, as the history seemed to dislike the creatures strongly and thus urged the Argonians of the marshes to stay away from the giants. It isn't too strange that the Hiss disliked them, as the Hiss seemed to like control, and since the Mars giants are not their creation and are rather just nature spirits, it would make sense of the Hiss to be wary of them. That said, other than the line that they are forest spirits, we don't really know anything as to their origins. Uh, if they are truly related to the Spriggans, then they are probably associated with the goddess Kinnereth or Kine, but we don't really know anything about that, as I have also seen people speculate online that they may be related to the earth bones of Valenwood, which are speculated in turn to be the Elnofe, which in turn would mean that the Mars Giants are a branch off of the Elnofe, who were the original inhabitants of Nern during the Dawn Era. But Really, we don't have any solid information on that, so I won't be opening that kind of worms in this video. With that being said, that was basically all I could tell you about these mysterious Mars Giants. We haven't seen them in any of the games, uh, but they're quite an interesting bit of lore, and I hope that we'll see one of them anytime soon, if the Elder Scrolls Online ever ventures back into Black Marsh again. I mean, we have this whole area of Black Marsh left to be created inside the game, so maybe it'll happen. But while we haven't seen the Mars Giants yet in any game, a creature that we have seen in the games before is the Hagraven. And trust me when I say that the lore around them is quite interesting. Let's take a look. Very basically, a Hagraven is a witch that craved power so much that she was willing to surrender her humanity and physical appearance in exchange for greater magical powers. A mere husk of humanity and a deformed human body fused with the body of a raven. The resulting creature is a very strong creature in the black magic arts and contrary to popular belief retains the intelligence and cunning that it had before the transformations. Although it's rumored that the Hagraven transformations also transforms a witch's emotions and drains much of the good aspects of their personality and emphasizes the bad aspects. Personality traits like jealousy, possessiveness and sadistic tendencies get stronger, while compassion gets weaker for example. Although we don't know if these were traits that the witch already has and haven't been emphasized, they just, they just were retained, while the good aspects were drained away. We don't know exactly how that works, but you can get the picture. Another thing that seems to come with the transformation is a sort of worry and jealousy about their own beauty and appearance. Uh, while they have completely surrendered that in the ritual, it's something that a lot of Hagravens seem to be concerned about. Hagravens themselves are actually quite rare, as the witches who choose to transform themselves must already be quite powerful, and witches on that level of power aren't super common, and most witches would not want to undergo the transformation, therefore the sight of Hagravens is quite rare. They do technically occur over all of Tamriel as the appeal of the transformations is universal, but the highest concentration of Hagravens exists in and around the Reach, as within the Reach there's the Reachmen and they are venerated by the Reachmen. The Reachmen, or Sorn as they call themselves in Skyrim, worship these creatures. Often this worship complex leads into a situation where the clans are led by Hagravens. In some clans it's even customary to be led by a witch who works towards becoming a Hagraven, and then when the next Hagraven dies, then another witch will go into training to become a Hagraven and then lead the clan again. 
We don't know much about the transformation ritual itself, and when I say not much, I almost literally mean nothing. It's been suggested by a lot of people online that the transformation is somehow linked to the Daedric Prince Nocturnal, but there's no in-game evidence that I could find for this, unfortunately. Uh, we do know, however, that the ritual gives their bodies not only much more magical potential, but also transforms and transmutes certain aspects, like, for example, the hands get claws, and those claws themselves have highly magical properties, as do the feathers that start growing on their bodies after the transformation. Uh, these are both ingredients that can be used in alchemy, and it's suspected that more aspects of their bodies also get highly magical properties, but we simply don't really know about the transformation details or the details of their body uh, after the transformation. As I iterated before, these transformations can be very useful for witches seeking great power and that are willing to pay any price and surrender their humanity. As such, it's not like Hagravens are united in any clan or anything, as witches just undergo the transformation individually. Many different witches have sought out the transformation over history. For example, some witches of the Glenmoril clan have undergone the transformations, as we can see in Skyrim. And undoubtedly many other clans have done the same and many individual witches have done the same. As such, the customs of Hangravens are very different, they uh, vary per individual. While most of them are vile and sadistic, jealous creatures, they all are different individuals and have different habits. It suggested that some Hagravens and Hagraven clans, for example, eat human and elvish meat, so are essentially cannibals, while others don't. And some also worship Daedric Princes and have their cults sort of in service for Daedric Princes like Namira or Hercene, while others don't and just are in the game for the power, so to say. Now, a final thing to note about Hagravens is that we have this book in the Elder Scrolls Online which describes the author of the book being a slave to a Regiment clan which was being led by a Hagraven. This Hagraven apparently had a husband and a son. Now, the husband was a powerful necromancer which makes some amount of sense as he's just there for the sort of power couple, so to say, and not really there for, you know, the personality of his wife or the looks. Like, I don't want to be objectivist, but Hagravens look pretty awful. But the fact that there was a son is pretty strange to me, as I would personally assume that when they surrender their humanity, they would have also become infertile. However, this doesn't necessarily have to be the truth, as within this book, the existence of a Hagraven's son is actually confirmed. But then we have to take into account that it's possible that this son was born before the transformation, when she was still a witch. Uh, if that's the case, it means that the Hagravens might still be infertile, but the book does not really answer the question, as... Uh, it doesn't really address whether the son was born before or after the transformation, meaning that it's still unknown whether Hagravens also surrender their reproductive capabilities in the ritual. Anyhow, that's basically all that we know about Hagravens. Pretty disgusting creatures, to be honest. Although, now it's time to talk about one of Tamriel's coolest animals, and I'll stand by that. The Dragon Frog, Tamriel's very best frog. Come on, man, it breathes fire. It doesn't get much better than that. So, the dragon frog. It's a strange creature which has the body of a regular frog, but dragon wings on its back and dragon-like spikes on its head. While they originally came from Hammerfell, they have spread across Tamriel and now they come in many different variants across Tamriel, with most subspecies of dragon frog being able to breathe fire, but some having evolved to even breathing poisonous gas. The different subspecies have evolved into many different colors, from the green viridescent dragon frog to the yellow butterscotch dragon frog, the blue blue oasis dragon frog, the red tangerine dragon frog, and the kaleidoscopic dragon frog, which is also red, the grey kindlespit dragon frog, and the purple sweet grape dragon frog. It seems like the grey kindlespit dragon frog from Hammerfell is in fact the original subspecies, which quickly evolved to take on several other colors as the species entered new habitats across southern Tamriel, as the dragon frog seemingly prefers warmer climates as none of the cooler provinces to the north have dragon frog population. Now, the dragon frog is quite an efficient hunter as it uses its breathing attack, like fire breath or poisonous gas, to attack and, in the case of fire, even roast bugs that are flying past, like flies, butterflies and dragonflies, which it then catches with its long tongue when it's dead. They are quite useful creatures, since they are really efficient bug eaters. Some have even bred them for pest control purposes, letting a few of these frogs in the house to quickly get rid of bug populations. As such, they make for quite useful and of course also really cute pets. But while some breed them as pets, others have bred them for food purposes. For example, the yellow butterscotch dragon frog likely lends its name to its tastes, as the Argonians tend to name creatures based on their taste, and this specific type of dragon frog lives in Black Marsh. And it's also said that the slowed, gigantic frog-like creatures from the continent of Thras, which is west of Tamriel, actually also breed dragon frogs as tasty snacks. 
Some other uses for the frog have been that their skin, while taxidermied, has excellent heat resistance and can for example be used to place hot pans upon. And it's also said that in years past the dragon frog was actually bred by the winemakers of the Somerset Isles as they could use its smell senses to perfectly ascertain whether or not their grapes were ripe. But this quickly adapting creature then changed its entire diet, no longer eating bugs but starting to eat wine grapes, turning them into a pest plague on the Somerset Isles, with winemakers having to go to great lengths to keep that subspecies, the sweet grape dragon frog, away from their vineyards as they eat the entire harvest if the winemakers aren't careful. Now, the dragon frogs have also been bred for their fire and poison gas breathing abilities, with some breeding them as pets to guard them so that they can burn anyone who tries to mug them, and others breeding them because the poison gas that they breathe actually isn't deadly to humans, elves, argonians or khajiit, but rather functions as a sort of hallucinogenic drug, so uh, yeah, these frogs are even able to give stoners a good time. Their strange biology, you know, a half dragon, half frog, also makes them a favorite of Tamriel's children, with many fairy tales and folk tales having been created, likely as children's stories, around the dragon frog. One children's story says that once the dragon frog were massive frogs, far in the past, who were jealous of the dragons and their wings. The dragon frogs then made a pact with the Daedric Prince Periite, who gave them wings, but in exchange made them really small creatures. Now, another children's story says that the dragons of old, which are supposed to be extinct to the people of Tamriel, remember, although they are basically everywhere with the way it's handled right now in the lore, but to the average peasant they are supposed to be extinct. But yeah, that story says that the dragons of old actually evolved into these fire-breathing frogs over time, so that's why the dragons are no longer there according to that children's story. Now one final thing that we learned during the Thieves Guild questline of the Elder Scrolls Online is that when it's mating season for these frogs, females of the species emit a really strong odor which looks like smoke apparently from the outside, which attracts all male dragon frogs of the area to the female dragon frogs, which can then result in massive frog gatherings. Pretty fun, right? So. Yeah, I hope I could convince you that the dragon frog is in fact Tamriel's coolest frog, far cooler than any other, specifically that lame mossfoot croaker frog. But that's unfortunately about all I can say about dragon frogs, although I'd talk this full video about them if I could. Now, let's talk about wisp mothers. There are subjects that cause heavy debate among even the most renowned scientists. Subjects that nobody really understands and the smartest minds of our world cannot come up with a consensus as to how to explain these subjects. In the Elder Scrolls universe, one of these subjects is Wisp Mothers. Nobody really seems to truly understand these creatures, and many scholars over the years have debated their origin, function, and whether they even exist, because no scholar has ever seen a Wisp Mother or survived seeing one, as it's one of the most dangerous creatures and only the most hardened warriors and mages can hope to even survive an ordeal with one of these creatures. Scholars trying to research the Wisp Mothers usually have to use second-hand accounts by warriors and travelers, and this has made the knowledge on Wisp Mothers one of the most fascinating debates on Tamriel. One of the few things that mostly everyone agrees on is that Wisp Mothers are strange, almost spectral-like women, clothed in mist and some connection to being undead. And they use wisps uh, to, to lure travelers to them or, and then kill them to get them to steal their energy. But other than that basic description, the knowledge of the, on them is very disputed. The theories about the origin of wisp mothers are all very different and can be separated into two categories. First, there are the folk tales and legends, and second, there are the theories by academics. Let's start with the folk tales. A lot of people tend to believe that the wisp mothers are just powerful ghosts that couldn't find rest. These people also tend to believe that the Wisps, the Wisp Mother's control, are the spirits of the previous victims who had become enslaved to the Wisp Mother that she killed. Others believe that the Wisp Mothers are remains of powerful Snow Elf witches who were killed during the war with East Grimoire and his Nord armies and found a way to persist. This theory of them being Snow Elves would seem very cool and interesting at first, and even has some merit to it, judging by Skyrim, as when we compare, for example, the looks of Galabor and Verther, the two Snow Elves still in their uncorrupted state, we find a striking resemblance with the outward appearance of the Wisp Mothers, without the whole cloaks and mist. In addition to that, the, a special named Wisp Mother, the Pale Lady we can find in Skyrim, has been named in lore as a mysterious figure named Amriel, an elven name, and has been described as fighting East Grimoire's heirs for decades as a Wisp Mother. So there is some significant merit to this theory of them being the remains of Snow Elves, However, since Elder Scrolls Online and Elder Scrolls Blades, uh, they have shown that Wisp Mothers exist in other places around Tamriel and Skyrim. This argument then gets a bit weaker, as Snow Elves ne never really ventured all too far away from Skyrim as far as we know. 
However, it might be possible that some Wisp Mothers are the remains of Snow Elves, as Sadran Sarethi, an expert on elite culture and First Era history, argues that Wisp Mothers are probably the result of a special type of lichdom that was discovered in the First Era by some witch tribe. He, de he theorizes that most Wisp Mothers came from a powerful clan of witches who discovered this way of lichdom to attain eternal life through being undead. So it's possible that this clan might have had some Snow Elf members, which would explain the story of Amriel and would explain why Wisp Mothers exist all over Tamriel. Soretti also argues that the accompanying Wisps are probably powerful conjurations by the Wisp Mothers and that they are under her full control and that they cannot live without her sustaining them. This theory is the theory that I probably personally believe as this would link up with the folk tales that we know about them and uh, also this clan would have discovered this type of lichdom back in the first era when there were still snow elves and they might have had lots of snow elf members which would explain the folk tales and for example explain the pale lady. Alternatively, Synod researchers think that the Wisp Mothers are not a type of undead. Rather, they argue that there are elemental manifestations rising out of Nern itself, a bit like Spriggans and Ice Raids. Lindette Villain of the Synod argues that they are essentially the elemental personification of snow and mist, wielding those elements naturally instead of being an undead who manipulates it through sorcery. She also argues that the Wisps accompanying the Wisp Mother are almost literally her children, making her truly a Wisp Mother. Uh, this, she says that these are probably subspecies that lure the victims to her and then share in the energy that the Wisp Mother steals from her victims. So these are basically the major visions on Wisps and Wisp Mothers. Uh, which exactly is true we don't know. Maybe neither is true as we don't learn much about the mysterious Wisp Mothers. And there isn't really much lore to them. It just seems like Bethesda just kind of created them as enemies and then was like yeah let's write a couple of things on them but not more. Because this was literally all the lore I could find on them. So that means it's time to move on to the next creature. So for the next creature, we will talk about the Slowed. So most people by now have at least heard of the Slowed race in their homeland of Thras. While this race of amphibious, often called slug-like creatures have not appeared in a lot of Elder Scrolls games, they've made a few appearances in the Elder Scrolls Adventures Red Guards and the Elder Scrolls Online, with multiple Slowed appearing in the Elder Scrolls Online Somerset DLC. They are the masters of magic and necromancy, with teleportation and levitation magic being the primary method of transportation within their society. This is due to their bodies, especially in adulthood, being very inconvenient to move around, as you can probably see in the pictures. They are also the masters of necromancy and have an innate adeptness to it and love experimenting on dead bodies. Some legends even tell of magical airships being used by the Slowed in order to transport masses of Tamrielic dead to the Thras Islands in order to be used for experimentation. And sometimes when they can't find Tamrielic dead bodies to experiment on, it's said that they will even experiment on their own children, or larvae as some call them. But usually Tamrielic bodies are relatively easy to come by, as it's Redguard tradition to bury the dead by the sea on islands, and thus the Slowed would often scout the coast of Hammerfell for their experimentations, sometimes even setting up field laboratories for sorts there. Their society is known to have little in terms of morals or compassion, as Slowed are extremely self-centered and usually only scheme for their own benefits. And the Slowed are known to break laws rather easily when the laws obstruct their goals. They will easily steal, torture or murder if that's in the line with their goals. And most Tamrielic observers agree that the notion for greed is the only thing that the Slowed have ever displayed in terms of emotion. They do not seem to seek love, are not interested in friendship or loyalty or anything of the sort. Most adult Slowed don't even care about the survival of their own race and they are being more occupied with their own experiments. It is said quite quickly after the reaching of adulthood, the Slowed will lose their capability for reproduction and that from that moment on they will solely care about their own goals. This results in a clear division between young Slowed and older Slowed, with Slowed and adolescents, which are not able to survive on land, being the ones responsible for their reproduction in the sea, and older Slowed, after they can start living on the land, disconnecting themselves from the others to focus on their own business. Once a Slowed reaches adulthood, it will no longer care for the fate of its own children and, as said before, will sometimes even experiment on their own kin or they will use that Slowed larva for the production of Slowed soap, a weird alchemical substance making an appearance in Morrowind and the Skyrim Creation Club. In addition to a proficiency in magic and necromancy, a sharp mind is very much valued in the society of the Slowed. The greatest heroes of their society are those with sharp minds that overthink every little detail of their plans, sometimes contemplating for years and then manage to execute their plans flawlessly. 
Being hasty and reckless is being heavily frowned upon in the society of the Sloths, with their great villains being the ones that act hastily and recklessness. So, most of the Sloth population is known to be very cautious in their decision making. It is said that it takes a very long time to get a clear answer from a Sloth, as a Sloth will usually just intentionally ponder their answers for a long time and don't choose to answer hastily, and rather wait until they've basically examined every little tidbit about the answer they want to give. Something interesting to note here is that most of the Sloth are known to be completely illiterate. They cannot read or write, they can only speak and listen. Their memories, however, are the best on all of Nern, and their capabilities of their memory far exceed that of our own, with them being able to flawlessly remember everything since becoming sentient in adolescence. As far as we know, the Sloths do not worship any pantheon of gods, they don't have a pantheon of their own, and do not recognize the authority of gods, but they do recognize the existence of gods and Deja, and when it serves their own goals, they will sometimes even worship a Deja Prince in order to get some kind of benefit. But this is done solely for their own goals, more like a business transaction, it's not genuinely worship for a prince. The same goes for individuals on Tamriel, they will not subject themselves to any ruler, for example they won't subject themselves to the emperor or anything like that, but they respect powerful necromancers and those individuals with a sharp mind and have allied themselves with them throughout the years whenever it serves their own purpose. A good example of this is their alliance with Mena Marco, one of the, if not the greatest necromancers that has ever lived. They basically allied with them for their own goals, because he had similar goals to them, being a powerful necromancer. That said, none of these allies ever seem to have visited their coral kingdom of Thras, a chain of 16 islands in the far west of the Abyssinian Sea. These islands constantly change sizes through unknown means. Some say through magic, while others say through the tides. Another term, Relic Observer, simply blame it on inaccurate and incomplete accounts of the islands. The accounts of those who've seen the great coral kingdoms of Thras are mostly incomplete, as not many who accidentally sailed there ever returned, with most of them getting lost at sea and then being captured by the Sloths, killed and then used for necromantic experiments. The only ones that seem to have ever been welcomed to visit the islands and lay a gaze on its wonders and the large coral tower were the Marmor, whom with the Sloths seem to have a loose alliance in the past. The few accounts that we have of their islands, however, all depict a large coral tower, a large tower made out of blood red coral built upon one of their islands, and said to have been even larger than the white gold tower. With that being said, the tower got destroyed during the invasion of Thras by the All Flags Navy, a navy formed of troops from all of the nations of Tamriel sent to Thras to destroy it as a payback for the Thracian Plague which the Sloths had unleashed on Tamriel several years before. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, because due to their necromantic tendencies and their self-serving nature, the Sload and the races of Tamriel have never been the best of friends. There have often been wars, invasions and other instances in which Usually the contact wasn't very nice. They've been at odds with the inhabitants of the Somerset Isles especially, seeing as parts of the islands are seen as their property by the Sloths. They've sieged cities on the islands multiple times, in the end all failing, with the most famous probably being the Siege of Skywatch. However, at the start of the last millennium of the First Era, the Sloth committed their most gruesome deed. They unleashed the Thracian Plague upon Tamriel a plague responsible for the halving of Tamriel's population and livestock. Once the plague had started to subside, the rulers of Tamriel assembled the largest coalition ever assembled on the continent and constructed a large fleet, the All Flags Navy, in order to burn Thras to the ground and kill every slow that they could find. It is said that as a result of the invasion, countless slows lay dead, the coral tower was destroyed and the islands had sunk into the bottom of the sea. We do not know, however, whether the Tamrielic forces sunk the islands to the bottom of the sea and destroyed the tower, or whether the Sloths did this on purpose in order to ward off the navy, as the Tamrielic forces could not operate on the bottom of the ocean, while the Sloths are amphibious and thus can survive underwater. After this, the Sloths managed to regain most of their strength and assaulted Tamriel many more times, with their islands eventually completely re-emerging from the sea. But never again did they unleash a plague like the Thracian Plague again. Perhaps even the self-centered Sloth became averted to such an idea after the slaughter of their race by the All Flux Navy, as before their islands sunk, a lot of Sloths were killed. So, finally, what have we not covered in this video yet? Well, first of all, the case of Ngesta, the slow that we can meet in the Elder Scrolls Red Guards. This slow managed to actually learn how to write, something that's very, very rare in their society. And as far as we know, Ngesta is the only slow that ever did it. 
and it said that Ngesta was feared for it within their own society. Second, it said that the Sloats have a leader of some sort, or had a leader of some sort. From the very limited accounts of this that we have, it said that this leader is a very large bloated Elder Sloat, with the title Elder Distendent One. But what exact authority this figure has is unknown, as most Sloats are self-centered, and I can't imagine a very tight law working there. Unless it's like a very libertarian kind of thing. And finally, there are multiple Sloat Kingdoms. Uh, the Sloat Kingdom of Thras is by far the most well known. However, the Sloats that we can see in the Elder Scrolls Online are actually Sea Sloats, which are Sloats from the underwater kingdom of Ulvorkus, which are said to have been founded by Sloats that were basically chased off the Somerset Isles by the first Altmeri inhabitants. We don't know the politics between the different Sloat Kingdoms, but we do know that the Kingdom of Thras is by far the largest and most powerful. However, other than that, we don't really know that much about the slow, despite them actually appearing in one of the games. But that does mean that it's time to move on to the last creature in this video now, the Ice Wraith. Ice Wraiths are one of those enemies that made their first appearance in the Elder Scrolls series by the time of Skyrim. However, they've existed in lore for far longer, as the first edition of the Pocket Guide to the Empire makes mention of them in the Skyrim section. In this section it stated that young Nords go out into the mountains for weeks on end to hunt the mighty Ice Wraiths. They do this to be recognized by their communities as worthy members of the community, and become worthy citizens of Skyrim. It's even mentioned in the making of Skyrim that the Ice Wraith was one of the first enemies that they thought of, since it was one of, the, one of the first enemies of Skyrim that they knew of in lore, and that they had to imagine in a certain way. As the only piece of lore prior to Skyrim of the Ice Wraiths was that young Nords would go into the mountains to fight them. We don't really see this phenomenon happening anywhere in Skyrim, except for when you join the Stormcloaks, when Galmar wants you to prove yourself as a hardened warrior by defeating an Ice Wraith. He tells you that this is how many men have tested their metal for ages, meaning that this custom is still being practiced to this day. A fact which is also backed up by, the con by a conversation with Maurice Aravel, a Dunmar merchant. Understandably, many people don't really have a struggle with this test, as long as you have some skill. As in the Herbane's bestiarity, uh, ice raids are basically described as quite simple minded creatures that are fast, but that aren't too smart, and some technique combined with brute force and a good weapon would be enough to fell one of the beasts. The author even mocks the more Nordic tradition of fighting the Ice Raids by boasting how he defeated two of them with general ease himself. But it doesn't really matter how easy to defeat they are, what we care about is what they are. The bestiary describes them as lucid serpentine creatures consisting of magic that seem to be conjured from Skyrim's frozen land itself. This is mostly confirmed by Synod researcher Lindette Felaine, who states that Ice Raids are just elemental manifestations that arise out of Nern. Uh, that innately wield the power of their elements, in this case ice, as they are ice raids. This also makes sense, because ice raids have the unique ability to hide in the ice and snow by more or less fusing with it, making them invisible for a short while. However, because they are named ice raids, uh, with raid being a synonym for ghost, some people have theorized that these creatures are in fact lost spirits who manage to get fused with the ice, or that they might be Daedric in origin, in the same way that people theorize that Spriggans are to be Daedric in origin. Especially that last theory has been made because of their similarities to Spriggans. They wield the power of their element, and they tend to lurk around and protect significant places. Other than serving as an initiation ritual for young Nords, the Ice Raids are also very attractive to both alchemists and people dealing with fresh products. Because when you grind a fresh Ice Raid teeth, it can be used as an extremely powerful preservative ingredient that can keep vegetables and meat cold for a limited time. However, I don't know how prevalent this thing is across Emeril as it seems to be a relative butcher secret, so it might only be known to a few butchers and traders. Next to that, the teeth of Ice Raid are also very powerful as an alchemical ingredient that's quite rare to come by because of the method to obtain them, because it includes slaying the beasts themselves. And finally, the thing that we know is that an encounter with them can get you Witbane, a disease which can lead to memory loss and can lead to intelligence being lowered. 
And that concludes the lore on Ice Wraiths. And it also concludes this lore collection video. I may do more of these collections if you guys like them. For example, I was thinking of doing a world building collection where I give some of my world building videos like Tamriel's board, dice and card games, or the martial arts of Tamriel, or the lore on sex, a similar treatment. And then make one big long form lore video out of all their content. So let me know if you guys would like that. I mean, this has been an experiment and I hope that you like it. And if you don't, tell me, please. I want to know. That being said, I do hope that you enjoyed this. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel and watching my weekly regular lore videos. Because usually all these little segments that I covered in this video of all the creatures, those are just separate lore videos. Because I don't have time for much more every week. So yeah, I cover a myriad of topics every week from everything. From the cool dragon frog to how sex works on Tamriel and how different cultures view it. So I mean, there will be something for you. See you next week.